the moon of Muharram comes. And at that moment you realize that everything that you've worked for the entire year is for that specific moment. Your entire life, your existence, the worth of your living begins on that moon. We all question ourselves, like, what is our purpose in life? What are we doing here? Where are we going? You try and focus yourself when you realize that this life means really nothing. Our entire existence, our wujud, our coming into this world is for one purpose. And that is to give homage to Imam Hussein and the sacrifice that he gave. Whenever I've come to Karbala and when I've gone back to Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, I've noticed that there is a change within me. He, to me, always has been a symbol of hope. In my darkest hours, in, in my worst days, I just think of Imam Hussein. I personally feel that I've been invited by my Imam as I got a dream for a continuous 3-4 days and my last day was a man sitting on a horse um, with no hands coming towards me and calling me. Most people go there and ask. I didn't ask. It was emotional for me. I said the boss would understand and so would Imam Hussein. They would understand. That's good enough. If I were to tell one, one thing that the, a person has to do in his entire life, that would be the only thing that you have to do. Over 1400 years ago, on this blessed land of Karbala, on the 10th day of Muharram, 61 AH, the grandson of the Holy Prophet of Islam stood in the face of 30,000 soldiers. He sought to safeguard the pure religion brought by his grandfather from being infiltrated by the self-proclaimed Caliph Yazid, the son of Muawiyah, and his venomous ideology. In the midst of the desert plains of Karbala, having witnessed the massacre of his dear sons, brothers, nephews, and closest companions, Hussein stood alone, overlooking the corpses of his beloved and made a call, a call that transcended the limits of time and space, a call that echoes in the minds of his lovers to this day. Hal min nasirin yansurna, is there any helper to assist us? Hussein lit the torch of justice and remained steadfast upon the path of the truth. He fulfilled his duty to the Almighty, mindful of the pleasure of none but his Lord. For the sake of all nations and generations, he bore the wounds of his 72 beloved, contented and persevered until he met with his Lord drenched in his own blood. Hussein persisted with but a single purpose, to ensure humanity remains alive. And for this, humanity remains forever indebted to Hussein. It is for this reason every year, on the 40th day after the 10th of Muharram, millions of lovers from across the globe depart from their homelands and converge on the holy city of Karbala to visit him and pay their respects. People of all races, backgrounds, tribes and creeds answer the call made by the Master of Marches on the day of Ashura and flock towards his blessed city where they are greeted and welcomed by Sayyidah Shuhada himself. Many communities from different parts of the world organize trips for those who wish to go to Karbala for the purpose of visiting the Master of Martyrs. In December 2015, on the Arba'een of Imam Hussein, one particular group from Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, accompanied by Sayyid Ali Abbas Rizvi, embarked on the journey towards Karbala to renew their pledge of allegiance to Imam al Hussein. My name is um, Abbas Rimtullah from Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. 
and I, like every year, have been coming for Ziyarat of Arba'in. I'm here again to give my services for the lovers of Hussein and for whatever little I can do for Imam Hussein. I started bringing the first group of sawars in 2007 to Iraq. Before that, I was coming on my own. During 2003, after the fall of Saddam, I started coming to Iraq. But then in 2007, I decided a lot of people wanted to come to Iraq and were not able to. So I thought to myself, I could be able to do a little bit of service for Imam Hussein. And that's how I started doing my ziyarat trips to Iraq. Alhamdulillah, I feel, personally feel that I've been invited by my Imam as I got a dream for a continuous three, four days. And my last day was a man sitting on a horse um, with no hands coming towards me and calling. It just made me feel that now it's high time that I make a decision and report to my mom about this so she can, inshallah, bring me to Karmala. She believed that she herself was called as well, so that's what made us come here. Um, I came very last minute. I've been wanting to go for the last year, and I actually had a plan to go in February. Um, but I was lucky that it worked out that I came earlier for Arba'in. Um, I wanted to come to Karbala because in life everybody has their trials and tests that they have to deal with. And I've had my fair share this year as well. And I've done a lot to try and find where I belong, who I am. And everything I've tried hasn't really sat well with me. And finally I realized that it was something deeper that I was looking for. The deeper thing was to come to this land, this land of Shifa, this land where people get cured of their, you know, their anxiety or, you know, negativity. I wanted to come here to try and bring some positivity into my attitude, into my thinking. And I wanted to find, I wanted to find myself. And we're all from the Imam, you know, we are his children. And he, um, this, this, you know, this is our land. Imam bought this land. And so, when people find themselves, they come, they go, they go to where they're from. And so I had to come to Karbala to find out where I was from. It is at the shrine of Imam Hussein that broken hearts are mended and lost souls find their way. He is a source of hope to the hopeless and a friend to the lonely. Indeed, Imam Hussein does not allow his visitors to leave from his doorstep except that they leave with their hearts contented and souls at peace. No visitor of his is turned away empty-handed. I've been on this journey, um, but it took me a while to get here. Oh, I was on the other side. And then um, I kind of just found my way here right before Ramadan. And just one after the other, I took a few steps and I saw his jumping hurdles. And I was like, how oh, did I get here so soon? I guess it's the niyat that, that, that you have to wh where you want to get at. And um, if it's your heart is clean, you get there. I was lost for a very long time. Um, I think it was the fact that we all question ourselves, like, what is our purpose in life? What are we doing here? Where are we going? And um, I'm the kind of person I need to know what's behind, like, after the finish line. Where am I going to end up? The bigger picture. I didn't see it, where I was around me, who I was with, a, a lot of aspects. And um, I think that night before, before Ramadan, when I decided to put my scarf back on my hijab, um, I said that I think this is the way that I should have always been. Like, how did I lose my way? It was right in front of me. My religion has been right in front of me my whole time. How could I have been so ignorant? I felt guilty. I felt ashamed. But I repented. I repented. And a lot of people I spoke to, older, more spiritual, sheikhs, wives, they said that God's already forgiven you. Have you forgiven yourself? And I said, I don't think I have. Like, I don't think I've got there yet. But why not if God's forgiven you? It. it it took me a while. I think Iran really helped. That environment, um, the purpose I went for, what I went there for, it, 
it helped me make some really good, huge decisions. The main reason why I've come here is because I want to improve as a human being. Whenever I've come to Karbala and when I've gone back to Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, I've noticed that there is a change within me. Therefore, I've come here to make an improvement in myself. And another reason why I've come here is to salute the man who has sacrificed everything for the religion of Islam. It's the love that uh, my family and that I have for the Imams and Imam al-Hussein especially and Azrat Abbas because I'm named after him. He's been my role model throughout my life and uh, yeah, that's why I'm, I decided to visit. It was actually last minute. Uh, Abbas Rimtullah just comes up to me and is like, you coming to our brain with me? Like, okay. It was a shocker for me. Hussein is uh, he's everything to me. He is the reason of pretty much everything that I do um, back at home. Uh, he inspires me. He he's the reason for everything of mine. So coming back to him is always it's it's like coming back to my own home. Imam Hussein. As a, as a, you know, as a personality, has has changed for me since I was young. You know, the battle of Karbala for me was when I was younger was about you know a, an imam dying of thirst. And as I've gotten older and tried to understand the tragedy a bit more, and understand imam a bit more, Imam Hussein for me is a, is a role model. He is one of the greatest leaders. He's, a, he's somebody who stood up for justice. He's a figure of humanity, really. I can't really explain, but Imam Hussein is, like I said before, he's, he's, our, he's our father, he's our grandfather. <laughs> In my darkest hours, in, in, in my worst days, I just think of Imam Hussein. I just think of everything that he had to endure, everything that he went through and his family went through. Uh, and I just feel that my troubles, whatever I'm going through, are completely mean nothing. Uh, and that the lesson he's left for us is that out of adversity, comes triumph and as long as as long as you have the will to see yourself through the adversity that you'll come out good at the other side. The first thing I would say is that oh Abba Abdullah, whatever you have done, thank you very much. That it is due to you that the religion of Islam has been saved. Because Yazid was ready to destroy the religion of Islam. He had actually said in the Quran, in Surah 4, verse 43, he had already made a statement when he was the Khalifa. La taqrabu salata. Do not go near prayer. He had already taken out a fatwa. that do not go near prayer. He had started making alcohol halal. He was about to destroy the religion of Islam. But Imam al Hussein was the one who stood up against Yazid. People started to realize, after the day of Ashura, people started realizing the truth. Because of Abba Abdullah, the religion of Islam was saved. Otherwise, this religion would have been finished. That is why Swami Shankaracharya, he says, that if anyone today is ready to even take the name of Islam, even to say the word Islam, it is only because of Imam Hussein's sacrifice. No doubt, due to Imam al-Hussein, the religion of Islam has been saved. 
not only has Islam been saved, but humanity has been saved due to Imam Hussein's sacrifice. You know, the one thing that comes into my mind is on the night of Ashura, Habib ibn Mubahir, Shaykh al-Awliya, a man who Amir al-Mu'mineen had taught knowledge of manaya wal balaya. A tradition says he would look at the water, and just by looking at the water, he says to one of his companions, Ma'awi has died. He says, how do you know he's died? You know, what do you know? He says, no, Amir al-Mu'mineen taught me a knowledge. He goes in my mind that on that night, when his companions or his friends came to him and said to him, the daughter of the Prophet doubts us, the way that they went forward to the tent of the Imam, they put their head on the ground, they put the dirt on their heads, and the way that they addressed the Imam. At the end of the day, that's Shaykh al I'm nothing compared to that man. So I think of myself like this, that as opposed to some people who are standing there taking pictures, if I'm going to the Imam, what is the etiquette of going? The ninth of Muharram, the night of Ashura teaches me how to do that. Is to go there, is to put my head down onto the door, and then a prayer always comes to my heart, says, Mola, I've put my head on your doorstep. Don't ever let me put my head on anybody else's doorstep. And you rub the dirt on your face, and you rub the dirt on your head, because that for me is the protocol that Habib taught us. And then after that, you wait. One of the great maraja, when I was slightly younger, has passed away now. He'd say, he'd say that when it comes to Sayyid al-Shuhada, do not walk inside of a shrine until tears don't come into your eyes. He says, this is the idhan. Idhan is not just something which is recited, but it's something which is felt. When the tears flow from your eyes, at that moment, then you've been granted permission to go in. And the question is always asked, and you're always scared, say, if the tears don't come into my eyes, then what do I do? And then you come and realize, no, this is Ahlul Bayt. The house is so merciful that when you ask, you'll find that you enter. It's focus. After you give your salam and you enter. And then as you're making those steps towards the Imam, you know that all of your desires lie there. And I've always seen that regardless of how many people there are, you know, if you just have patience and you ask the Imam to help you, you'll see the pathway slowly opens up in and of itself. Many traditions outline the futility of one's beliefs and actions devoid of the love for the Ahlul Bayt. The visitation of the shrines of the infallible Imams, and in particular Imam Hussein, is a true demonstration of this love and affection. Since love and affection are of utmost importance, the weightiness of visiting the Imam increases manifold, as it is the best proof and evidence for it. Visitation strikes a chord between the Imam and the visitor that takes root in the visitor's heart. Not only is it an emotional bonding, but one that is rooted in recognition that the Imam is Allah's special representative upon his earth, obedience to whom Allah has made mandatory upon his creation. <laughs> Imam Ali ibn Musa al rida relates, there is a binding contract on every Shia and follower towards his Imam. And the most perfect and beautiful way to fulfill this contract is to perform the visitation of the grave of that Imam. For those people who have never been understand this, it's different from sitting down and listening to a majlis or majalis all of your life. And when you physically go there, it's a different matter. Your entire ball changes, your ball plan changes, your game plan changes. It's just a 24, kind of like 360 degree turn. Your 24 hours become completely different. So for me, when I get there on a personal experience is that the minute that you grab onto that zari, you know everything that you ask for is mustajab. So ask for something which is lofty. Ask for the love of the Ahlul Bayt. Remember one thing, whatever you have in life, the one thing that's priceless is their love. If you don't have their love, you have nothing. 
you could be walking around this world, the eighth Imam alayhi salam says, look, if you've got love, that's everything. That's the greatest wealth for you. So be the be one of those people who asks for that for that love. You know, focus. Let go of everything. Let go of the world. Let go of who you are. Let go of who you are. Forget fame, fortune, wealth, family problems, marital, children, property. Forget everything. If you've got one shot in your life, if you've got one opportunity, this is the whole thing. You don't know if it's going to come again. Make the most of it. Understand who you're standing next to. Everything will come. Protection will come. Money will come. Respect will come. Everything will come. The main thing is just to focus. And when you grab onto that zari, give salam to your imam. Zinda milori, sakina so rahi hai. The spiritual and material benefits that a visitor gains from performing the visitation of Imam Hussein are countless in number. Imam Muhammad al Baqir relates that if people truly understood the merits of visiting the sacred shrine of Imam Hussein, they would have died from yearning for it and their breathing would stop in craving for it. Uh, name is Nasir Somji, originally from Dar es Salaam, living in Bangkok, uh, Thailand. And uh, we have basically come here. I brought my son. Simply, I guess, because there's something that happened in, uh, something that happened last year. Uh, one of the Zawars heading uh, to uh, for our main, I requested him uh, to shout this little boy's name in in uh, in, in, in Imam Hussein uh, Imam Hussein's uh, uh, Zari area in the Haram. And he came back and he told me, yes, I've done the job, but never thought that this, you know, this could actually happen. And that's probably why we're here today. I would say the call was for him because I asked for him, not for myself. I'm just a person that's just with him. Boy was uh, had some issues from day one, um, two hours after birth, and you know, and it was on the day, and he was in hospital for a good five months, six months, and uh, against all, uh, uh, you know, I broke all the rules, everything, signed documents, took full responsibility, but I made sure I took him to uh, Hazrat Ali Asghar's. Uh, uh, some okay, and uh, it was that particular day while the bayan was going on. We, you know, that was his last uh, episode uh, of, of uh, seizure. He suffers from seizures. He's epileptic, and uh, that was the last. That, that was that was it, uh, and I wanted to make sure that I should bring him to uh, at least Makam Ali Asghar. For me, obviously, a personal journey of feeling that close physical proximity to the Imam and his progeny. Uh, but to me also, it's also a statement. It's, 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 um, it's a statement of defiance, really. I'm here as a statement. I'm making a statement. I'm, I'm telling those people who don't want us to be here that we are going to be here. We are going to be here in large numbers, and we're going to be here every year. And every year, our numbers are going to increase. The more you try and stop us from coming here, the more we're going to come. Uh, so there is, uh, it's actually, as much as it is a spiritual journey, there is a little bit of political dimension to it as well.
I've been hearing Karbala, I've been hearing uh, Najaf, I've been hearing Kufa, I've been hearing, uh, you know, uh, Sham, all these places. Okay? Um, and I actually wanted to feel it. And that is why I'm here also. Because seeing is believing also. Huh? Not that I never believed it. Yes, I believed it. But you feel. That's the difference. You feel more when you're here. It was that particular time that he was in hospital that we ended up... Uh, I broke all rules, hospital rules. He was hospitalized at the time. He... Uh, we ended up in... Uh, you know, I, I signed documents. Taken full risk. Ended up at... Hazrat Ali Asghar's... Majlis. Where he had his last uh, episode. Major one. I could have lost him, but I left him. While the bayan was going on, I left him, because I knew I was protected, and he was protected more so. I left him. We were supposed to call an ambulance, we were supposed to give him oxygen, we were supposed to do IV on him immediately. We did nothing. I did nothing of that sort. I left him. And thereafter, he was perfectly well. A big risk it was, huge risk. But anyway, um, he survived it. He's been fine since then. And that was it. That was soon after that. The second day or third day, third day, we were released from hospital. Let me wrapped. On the third day. Personally, I never used to believe all these things. <laughs> that was my experience. That was my experience. This is what I saw. This is what I experienced. That these things do happen. Right in front of you. Allah knows who's standing there. But I've heard from the elders that Imam is the man stands there and he waits for all of the Zawar of Hussein. As you go there, go there with respect because you know Imam Zaman is waiting. As you go there, understand that a broken body is lying there. All of the ribs are shattered, the head is mutilated, the body is bleeding, and we are watching. So let's start. Focus. Fatima al Zahra. We have come from all over the world to be with your son today. We are here. Don't look at our mall. Look into our hearts and see. All of these people around me have love in their hearts for your son. Except all of these. Look at whose heart and see. Who had respect. But all of these Shia have love in their hearts. Fatima to Zahra. Look into their hearts and take out that love. Fatima to Zahra, know that we were raised on the wilaya of your son and know by God that we will die on the wilaya of your son. Every year we will commemorate this until the last breath, even if they were to chop our bodies to a thousand pieces and put scattered all over the skies, we would continue to say, Come inside the shrine now. No say of the shrine is waiting for you. La Baker Ya Hussein. 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 La Baker Ya Hussein.
The utmost essence of the message of Imam Hussein is manifested in the magnitude of the service provided to his visitors throughout the route from Najaf to Karbala. No doubt it is the love of Imam Hussein which brings out the best in people. Thousands of camps called Mawakib are set up along the road leading towards Karbala. Many people, despite their own poverty, save up the entire year so that they are able to offer whatever they can to the pilgrims. It is as though Imam Hussein, having died hungry and thirsty, ensures that not a single visitor of his remains hungry, thirsty or uncared for. I actually met a couple of Iraqi people who save the whole year just to give on the day of Arbaeen. They have the whole savings set up and then they on the day of Arbaeen or the week before the day of Arbaeen when everyone starts walking, they just give everything out to charity in the name of Imam Hussein. Um, there's one uh, lecturer that I was listening to and he said that these people, they are the, the amount of food that they're giving day, day in, day out, even at, during the night, before namaz, uh, subuh and everything, they want to make sure that in the land of Karbala, no one, no one that is a visitor or a zayir of Imam al Hussein goes hungry or even thirsty. Usually we always complain in our lives. We always complain that I have this problem, I have that problem, I have this problem. But after seeing them and seeing the amount of sacrifice they are keeping, we realize that what are we complaining for? Look at these Iraqis serving us free of charge. The whole year's earning, they sacrifice, the whole year's earning and they sacrifice for the Zawar of Imam al Hussein. Serving Imam Hussein, serving for the sake of Imam Hussein is, and Abul Fadl Abbas is, it's a major part of your faith because they sacrificed everything. Abul Fadl Abbas sacrificed both his arms. He sacrificed his only, he was the Saqqa, he was, he was his Babu Lawaj. You go to his door, you, you won't go back empty. Serving him is the only way to get through his door. If, if I were to tell one, one thing that the, a person has to do in his entire life, that would be the only thing that you have to do. This is, Karbala is the Jannat on earth. We've heard in so many narrations. You want to come here, not necessarily come to Karbala and serve. You can put the Niya, you can do the Niya in Dar es Salaam, in London, wherever you are. You can do the Niya for the sake of Abul Fadl. Pray for others before yourself. Pray for others. That's the only thing that we have to do. You pray for others, and Imam Hussain will listen to you. In regards to my recitations, I have uh, started very long time back, about uh, 15 years back or so. Uh, and the first Noha, if I can recall collect correctly, is uh, was on the first night of Muharram in Dar es Salaam when I was like trembling when my when my name was on the board and my uncle was literally with my mom practicing at home every day and night. At the beginning. Looking at the crowd and how Dar es Salaam has, has been over the years, once you go to the podium, uh, you will literally, literally have stitch fright, literally. But Alhamdulillah, with his blessings, with the gift of Fatima, I'm here, Alhamdulillah. <laughs> I mean, this is the only tabligh I believe, or I can say, the least I can do for the Ahlul Bayt. The least I can do for Ahlul Bayt. It can be a direct tabligh, an indirect tabligh. God has given me somehow broken voice here and there. Alhamdulillah, I get it through the message. People cry over one tear. I believe one tear from a Muslim 
if it goes through, inshallah, we can all have Jannah in our hands. That's it. You see, wherever I am, whether I'm in Dar Islam, wherever I am, but usually whenever I would recite, I would close my eyes and I would think the dhari, the dhari, the dhari of Imam Al Hussein is right in front of me. And I would start reciting. I would imagine that the dhari is right in front of me and now I begin to recite. Therefore, I feel more connected to Abba Abdullah. My soul connects with the soul of Abba Abdullah. The ziyar of Imam Hussein is sunnah to me, but the serving of the words of Imam Hussein is wajib for me. I'm here for that. I try to do my best for that. Imam Hussein has done so much for me. The least I can do is be of service to his zawars. In the same way Hussein epitomized the very meaning of sacrifice, his lovers strive to sacrifice what they can for his sake, in hope that they may be enlisted amongst his servants. The Arba'in walk from Najaf towards Karbala is a perfect demonstration of this. Regardless of ethnicity, background, status or sect, people from all walks of life gather in this area and united by his love share a common aim, to reach the land which hosts the shrine of their master and to serve his visitors in the best way they can. When you, you come out from Dar es Salaam, you think that you are the only one who loves Abu Abdullah. That's what we think that we are the only ones who love Imam al Hussein. But when we reach Karbala, we realize that there are millions of people who love Abu Abdullah Imam al Hussein. We realize that Islam is a we, not an I. Because we see Shias from Pakistan, Shias from Iran, Shias from Tehran. So we realize that there needs to be unity within Islam. Therefore, many different sects of Islam gather here in Karbala to commemorate the Arba'in of Imam al Hussein. And in this present era, we need unity because the Quran has commanded us in Surah Al Hujrat, verse 14 Inna khalaqnal insana min nutf, inna khalaqnal insana min dhakari wa untha wa ja'alnakum shu'uba wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu, inna akramakum inda Allahi atqakum, inna Allah alimun khabir. That we have created you of a male and female from different tribes and nations. Why? so that you may understand one another, not that you may despise each other. When you come to Abba Abdullah, when you come to Karbala, you realize that, you need, that we need to love one another. We need to love all the Shias that are there. At the end of the day, everyone has a love for Imam Hussein. So even though we don't speak the language of the Arabs, everyone knows what you're here for and they treat the Zawars with the most respect. You will see every person, every Iraqi, be it Iraqi, Iranis, the Pakistanis, every person in this world, when they listen to Imam Hussein and the message that Imam Hussein has, everyone's reaction for the Zawar is simply overwhelming and it's the best feeling that a person could ever have. I think every person in this world should know that Imam Hussein is a global person. He's not just a person for the Iraqis or the Iranians. Imam Hussein is for mankind. And when people like, when we go there, when we go there and they say Tanzania, People don't know that, you know what, Imam Hussein even is with, you know, like, he's his person who is known throughout the world. And uh, he's known in Tanzania, in America, in the UK, he know, he's known everywhere. And a lot of people just think, you know, that Imam Hussein is just an Iraqi person or, you know, an Iranian person. But hence, Imam Hussein is everywhere throughout the world. And everybody does the Jadari of Imam Hussein. When I was walking from the Mokib until Karbala, I just realized how much sacrifice the Iraqis keep for us because there are so many Iraqis. I saw an ulama sitting down and giving out tissue papers to the zawar of Imam al Hussein, an ulama. And there are so many Iraqis who are ready to serve food for free. And then I started wondering that which country does that? Only the Iraqis have a heart big enough to serve the zawar of Abu Abdullah because Imam al Hussein had said that take care of the zawar of mine. Therefore, the Iraqis have held on to the message of Abu Abdullah and they have taken care of us, the Zawar of Abu Abdullah. <laughs> If 
you have an opportunity, once in a lifetime at least, at least go to Karbala. That's heaven in peace. Heaven of peace. Once in a lifetime, leave your Mauritius, Dubai, Maldives, just leave it here. Go to Karbala, look how the Iraqis, all the people around here are so hospitable. Um, words cannot describe. Well, entering the shrines of the Imams or walking around the streets in Karbala is like walking through heaven. I mean, it's a heavenly feeling. You forget the world. You don't care about the material world. All you know is you're, you're in heaven and may these days last forever. May time stand still. The rest of the times it is not as hard as it is. Arba'in is a challenge for sure with the roads closing and everything. But of course, everything is for our good. And um, if, See, when you serve with the right intention, these guests are his. He makes way for them. He paves the pavement for them and everything else is taken care of by itself. Everything falls into place automatically when you're here. It has been a phenomenal experience, quite frankly. It's, it's been, I think if I tried to put it in words, it probably would not do justice to, to the event, to what's actually happened, to what I've been through. I think it's something that needs to be physically experienced. For, for somebody to actually understand the, the whole emotional and physical process that one goes through by being here, you actually need to be here. But to just try and put it in a few simple words, I feel that the connection that I've had with this place, with this land, with this soil, uh, as a Shia, which I was, I was born a Shia, and I have been a Shia all my life, and I didn't quite intend to die a Shia. Uh, so you always have that connection anyway. But the, the, the physicality of being here, the fact that every speck of dust in this land has the footprints of the Imam and his family. When I walk down those little roads that lead to the Haram, the only thought that I have in my mind is the Imam and his family would have walked down these paths. When you have that, that whole vista in front of you uh, and you try and visualize everything as to this is where the Imam would have been martyred. Over there is the river Farad, where Sayyidina Abul Fadl al Abbas would have gone to fetch some water. And, you know, that whole scene of Karbala, that whole thing actually starts to go through your mind like a slow motion video. And, and you, you do try and visualize that when you walk through there. And uh, to me, it's actually not just remembering every fine detail, but the greater purpose that why were they doing all this? Why were they there on the 10th of Muharram, on the day of Ashura? Why were these people there? Literally when we were entering Aba Abdullah's Haram, I could not stand, I could not stand, words cannot describe. I was literally speechless, that's why you could even hear on the audios and the videos, the only thing which was, which was heard was Labbaika Ya Hussein and Labbaika Ya Abbas. When we just entered Aba Abdullah, all the Marcias and Nohas were set up. But looking at the crowd, looking at the Zari itself directly, right in front of your eyes, there was nothing going across besides Labbaik Ya Hussein and Labbaik Ya Abbas. So when we were walking in the streets, I was, um, I was very 
anxious because I was I, I didn't uh, I don't know the the kind of the, the way we were going. So every turn we took, I was like, oh my gosh, are we at the are we at the home yet? Oh my gosh, are we at the home yet? And when we finally got to the home, we finally got inside the home. Um, it was it was it was incredible. I, it's the feeling was indescribable. And I you know turned to my turned to my left and there was the Zuri of Imam Hussein. And then we walked into the you know, the home of Hazrat Abbas and it was just right there. It was I, I, I can't really explain the feeling, but it was incredible. It was pretty overwhelmed, overcome. As soon as you see the tomb, as soon as I saw the tomb, tears just started falling off my eyes. It was just so beautiful that I couldn't um, remove my eyes from the sight of the tomb. We entered to the home of Imam Hussein and all I could hear was the sound of the big Ya Hussein, the big Abbas. That's all I could hear. There was no let me going on, there was no eulogies going on. It was just, everyone was saying that Mola, you were, we weren't there 1400 years ago, but we're here today. We're giving you the sound of Labbaik. We're praying for the reappearance of the 12th Imam so that we can be part of his army. Just knowing that I'm inside there and Maybe Imam Hussein will notice me. Maybe you'll see that one of the 30 million people have you know, come to visit him to pay his respect. The reason why I was at the front was because I wanted to control the crowd and because I wanted to show my face first, that the slave of yours has come first. The minute that you walk in, this is your last moment. It's almost as if, if there's nothing in my life now, this is everything that it stands for. That if I wasn't to live one second more, for everything now, entire life, from the beginning that I was young, from the beginning when my mother used to take me, regardless of hot or cold, to the majlis of the Imam, to now. This is where I'm facing my Mawla. And so at that moment, everything blanks out and you are making that movement towards the Imam. Nothing matters now. I only have one opportunity. I have one blast at it. I've been given a responsibility and I've been given the tawfiq to speak. So as I'm making my way, it's your entire body is tingling. You know what you're facing. You're looking at the master. You're going towards that person who set Hur free. He became Hur in one night. So you're going to that place, you want to be set free. But at the same time, more than that, you're coming for one purpose, and that's to give condolences. If you were not to ask for anything, it is the biggest reward, biggest tawfiq for you to be able to go there yourself, to be able to give your condolences. Honestly, I don't even know what happens from the minute that I walk in to the minute I walk out. If you were to ask me, I don't know what's happened, I'm lost there. And the minute that I see the shrine of the Imam, you know, that's me gone. I don't know then what happens. When I leave, then I come to realize, I come back to my senses that, okay, now I'm back into the world. At that moment, you're somewhere else. Call it the Arsh of Allah, as the Hadith says. It's like doing the Ziyar of Allah. Fawq Arsh. I've gone there now. And so that's my master. And at that moment, where are you? You're not in this world anymore. You're in a reality which you don't know. You come back only after you come into Bain al-Haramain. I was part of the Jalus and it was actually something which I didn't expect to happen. Uh, we walked into the Haram and as we were going into the main courtyard I felt as if I had there were thousands of people all around us and people jamming into each other crushing into each other and in that crush somehow I felt a certain calm you know I felt very serene I felt as if it was just me and the amount that I was actually talking to the Imam and the Imam was talking to me I felt that that instant connection with the Imam I felt as if 
there was just nobody else. It was just me and him. I felt his presence. I just wanted him to know that I was there. That, as much as has always been a part of my life, that me being there, I was letting him know that we are never going to we're never going to leave him alone. To that person inside of the his body is broken, regardless of the gold and the silver that you see there. His body is broken. You know, they say when his son came, how did he grab him? Look at the hadith. He'd lift up one part of the leg and the other part would collapse. He'd try and lift up his chest, one part would collapse. Here's a man whose body was broken completely. You know, when you stand there and you give your salam, Make sure that you understand that there's a reason why his mother's been crying for 1400 years. So understand, know that this man is Mother Loom. And there are very few people who are Mother Loom in the way that this man is. There's no one like that. The hurt, that pain should be there, but you feel almost that the Imam is still merciful. He, he doesn't look at his own pain, but he looks at your pain. Realization is important, Ma'arifah is important. Understand who you're standing in front of. Understand what that reality is. Most people go there and ask. I didn't ask. Because I knew he could feel me. I walked this boy. And uh, didn't ask. I just walked him. That's good enough. He would understand. As the Abbas would understand, and so would Imam Hussein, they would understand. It was emotional for me. But believe me, I didn't ask. <laughs> Welcome to Group Tanzania, to Karbala City. Don't go. The most emotional moment of my trip was we were in uh, the World Federation Mokib uh, when during the walk. I think it was Mokib 1086. We were sitting there and getting massages. So me and my friend were sitting there and uh, some old, I think a person from Yemen came there and uh, he, pulled, uh, he pulled up his, uh, his kanzu and he was missing a leg. So he started telling us that, you know, during, uh, back in when he was in Yemen, there was a car bomb and uh, he lost one of his legs and he also lost his wife during the car bomb. And uh, he basically said he has three kids and uh, he's like, I have nothing in life, but I'm going to the person who's gonna make, who can, you know, like, who can give me everything in life, and that's Imam Hussein. And he started making the walk. For me, this time while we were walking, I met a small four-year-old girl. She handed me a glass of water that I refused, and then one moment she just burst to me and says, "Shab my Hussein mat atashan, drink water. Hussein died thirsty." I broke out. I couldn't take it anymore, and uh, I had a glass of water. And it was uh, it was incredible when we went with the procession, because I think going inside and not having to rush was was incredible. Um, but it was again, like I said, a very surreal experience. We've we've just been. I think for me, it's been a very reflective trip. I think I've taken some time just to just to think about me and just to you know pray for those who I care about and who've asked me to pray for them. But it's been a very, um, I've taken some time to be, you know, internal. Obviously going to the Haram was a very emotional experience, but for me the most emotional thing was the first day we got here we recited um, Ziyarat in the morning with, with Abbas and my family. And we went to, um, we just, we didn't get to the Haram, we just went outside the Haram and recited Ziyarat. And for me, that was very emotional. Um, we then went to Makami Aliasgar, 
and we took my cousin Ali, who is disabled, and we took him there, and um, they they put him in the the cradle, and I think that was that was just it was incredible, but it was very emotional for all of us. The tragedy of Karbala and the fact that he's there and the fact that he like I know that he loves me so much that just it warms my heart every single time. I can't really grasp the depth of it yet. I think when I go home, um, I think it will hit me then. But at the moment, everything feels very surreal. I don't know how to feel. I have one wish in my heart that I feel, um, inshallah, every year I should come to Karbala with, my, with me and my family. I hope to get a sense of belonging, um, a sense of myself. I've come here to just to, to really get a sense of my responsibility as well as a Muslim. And I think I want to go back with some of that. I think I want to be a flag bearer of Islam in some sense. That when we leave from here, we are still the Zahir of Imam al Hussein. Our salam still reach Abba Abdullah. Therefore, when we reach Dar es Salaam, that experience that we had here, the improvement that we had, you know, when we leave from Dar es Salaam or we leave from anywhere in the world, people leave from Toronto, they come here, there is a change in them. They say, okay, from today I won't backbite. From today I won't do this particular sin. Now, when we go back to Dar es Salaam, that improvement should remain. I think Aziara is, is, is I, I personally believe that when you come for when you come for for ziyar, especially any ziyar, but because I've been coming to Imam Hussein so much, um, if you don't if you don't change something about yourself when you go back home, then I feel that there is no purpose of your ziyar. Of course, there is everybody. Nobody in this world is perfect, and neither am I. So I would, there's a lot of things that I would like to change about myself, and inshallah, when I go back, I will work on one after the other. If it was up to me, I would make it wajib upon every Shia to be here for the ziyar of Arba'een. Arba'een is what shows you what Hussein is. Arba'een shows you how selfless people can be for Hussein. In every way possible, I, it's, a, it's a dream of mine to be able to spread the love of Imam Hussein everywhere in the world. It's always a message that um, you, you have to stand up to oppression, you have to stand up against tyranny, you have to, you have to say no to tyranny in any shape or form. As I said in the beginning of uh, this talk, that one of the reasons I'm here is, uh, is a statement. I am making a statement by being here. And that is the lesson that you have to learn from Kabbalah. It is no surprise that much emphasis has been placed upon visiting Imam Hussein, for it is due to him that Islam is alive to this day. And for this reason, be it Eid, the 15th of Sha'ban, the Nights of Qadr, or the Day of Arafah, reciting the ziyara of Imam Hussein even from afar is an act which has been elevated to a degree like none other. By visiting Imam Hussein, a believer comes to realize the true purpose of his existence. A void exists in the heart of the lover, which can only be filled once he has visited and met with his beloved. Despite numerous efforts throughout history to suppress the visitation of Imam Hussein and to eradicate his remembrance and love from the hearts of the believers, today, the sheer number of visitors present in the vicinity of his holy shrine during the Arba'in pilgrimage testifies that Hussein and his legacy remains alive and triumphant. <laughs>